And and we're back in the room once again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Cayman Show, the show that keeps on giving to you, the viewers, you, the listeners. That's what we're all about. Now, joining me today, somewhat of an interesting guest who has appeared on our screens for many, many moons, but you might not know it. He is the master of puppets. That's what I'm calling him anyway. I like that one. Give it up for the one and only Simon Buckley. How are you doing, sir? You okay? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. It's an absolute great pleasure. As well, I have to say. Hey, fantastic, fantastic good stuff. I see Norby the Sheep, uh, who many of the viewers may, or some of the younger viewers may not know. Um, we spoke briefly at the top of the show there, and that is actually Norby the Sheep as appeared on our screens. Indeed. So beside me is the one and only, the original Nobby the Sheep. I say the original Nobby the Sheep. He did have a couple of facelifts during his time. And uh, he's now wearing a hat because unfortunately his ears have seen better days and have fallen off. But this, oh, is, God love actual, him. this is the actual Nobby the Sheep who appeared on Saturday mornings for six years and was last seen uh, on The Weakest Link with Anne Robinson. That's uh, right, I yeah. I worked out when that was, but that was a good few years back. Yes, so. it was. Yeah, I do we, remember. We both looked younger than that. Um, <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, it's lovely to see him, as mentioned earlier on as well. Somewhat scary looking into those eyes now, but uh, yeah, great stuff. I'm starstruck, you know, fantastic. Excellent. <laughs> um, so I understand you've been a bit busy yourself as well. You've been doing a master's degree. How's things going there? Is that complete now? Or? Yeah, so I've now submitted my dissertation, which is not in puppetry, but actually is uh, not unrelated to my, my work in television and theatre as, as a puppeteer. So I don't know what your guests know about me. I mean, you gave me a great build up as a master puppeteer, uh, uh, which was probably true at one point. Uh, I'm now sort of retired from puppetry and work in the centre of London as a vicar. Oh, excellent so, uh, stuff. Yeah. So that's my, that's my day job. I'm the, the rector of St Anne's Church in Soho. But I have behind me about 40 years, if not more, of, well, of being a puppeteer. Brilliant. That's amazing. So, so when did you make the, the transition to, to become a vicar then? You have to be careful about talking about transition in Soho. It can mean something else. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I haven't transitioned, uh, I, but I, I became the rector of St Anne's eight and a half years ago, but I was ordained 20 years ago. Right. And okay. In fact, for 12 years, I still continued to be a puppeteer working in television uh, and whilst being a priest in my spare time. And now I'm a priest full time and do the odd bits of puppeteering in my spare time. So Excellent it's a, stuff. It's just a bit of role reversal. Yeah, never goes away. Never goes Very away. Once, once you're in, you're in. <laughs> exactly so. Yeah. Brilliant. I like to keep my hand in as puppeteers. Ah, like. literally. I like what you did there. Oh, I, did I like what you did there. <laughs> Pun number one. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my first question, and everybody's going to want to know, obviously puppeteering, this isn't the sort of thing that they teach you in school, that you have a, a GCSE in or whatnot. So my first question, I guess, then, is how, where, when and why does one become a puppeteer? Well, there must be a story there somewhere. Well, I mean, everybody's uh, route uh, into puppetry is different. Mine started with my grandparents buying me Sooty and Sweet glove puppets when I was about four. Okay. And um, then I, I asked my parents if they'd buy me a string puppet for Christmas when I was eight. And um, actually, I've got that puppet here. Do you want to see it? Yes, yes, can please. I, can, yeah. I, can I sort of walk and talk, as it were? Yeah, you um, go, you go. So I, my parents bought me this really sweet little, oh, we need to get caught on something. Come on. Uh, this little wizard puppet. Oh, wow. When I was eight, the Pelham puppet. And they were very popular toys in the sort of 60s and 70s and even 80s, I think. And on Friday afternoons, we used to take our favorite toys into school. And I used to take my puppets in. Excellent. So one of the girls in my class was having a birthday party. And her mum said, would you come along and do a show? Oh, wow. So did a show and the wizard was in it. He played the xylophone. <laughs> and at the end of it, um, this little girl's mother gave me a pound. Next <laughs> night, a complete stranger phoned up and said to my dad, hello, I'd like to speak to Simon Buckley, the children's party entertainer. You'd already and, got the name. <laughs> <laughs> my dad said, well, you, you can, but he's only nine. And she said, that's all right, he's only a pound. <laughs> <laughs> already developed a reputation as being a bargain puppeteer. Absolutely. But your first, first paid gig at eight years of age or, or nine years of age, that's nine fantastic. Not bad. So then as a result of that, I joined various puppetry organisations, went to see professional puppeteers doing shows at the Little Angel Theatre in Islington and the Harlequin Puppet Theatre in Colwyn Bay. 
and they recognized that I had a talent for puppetry. You know, I wasn't just a child playing with toys. I was really passionate about this. So in fact, I became the first person to study puppetry on an education authority grant oh, uh, in awesome. Birmingham. And I wish I'd kept my grant form because it actually had me down as puppetry student 001. Ah. <laughs> which was quite nice. Um, and I, so I studied with a children's theatre company. It was a kind of apprenticeship rather than a formal uh, college course, as it yeah. were. But at the end of it, they gave me my equity card and a job in the company. And I stayed with that company for three years and did exactly, um, well, 12 different productions and almost a thousand performances between Birmingham and Hong Kong. That's amazing. In between. So yeah. that was my, my route. You know, it's a real childhood hobby. Uh, that, that just grew and grew and grew. So I've, I have been puppeteering now for 50 years. Wow. Uh, so that's, <laughs> and I charge more than a pound. Oh, say. I dare say, I dare say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inflation and all that, Simon, you know, it's, uh, exactly. it's, it's the way forward. Yeah, I've um, got a lot of puppets to keep as well, you know. They, yeah, so I see, is this just a small collection behind us here? A lot of, lot of hungry mouths behind me. <laughs> <laughs> These are all the ones that I've made over the years. Um, some of which have been used in different shows. Some I just made for fun. And actually, if I turn that, sorry, bear with me. Yeah. You can see up there. Oh, wow. Loads of other. I'm in, my, I'm in my public room at the moment. I'll just give you a quick. There's, you, see, you see the various sort of sheep and goodness knows what you're going to see around here, but <laughs> they, don't come, they don't, don't come to life at night, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so that was your start into puppetry then at, at yeah. nine years of age. Yeah. Um, so that's fantastic. So from there, um, obviously you, you did, you did your course, you got accredited and everything. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your, your first big gig then as, as a puppeteer? Oh, so the first big gig would have been at the Queen Elizabeth Hall on the South Bank with the theatre company from Birmingham, which was called Cannon Hill Puppet Theatre. And there were nine puppeteers, I think, in the company. And we worked really large, sort of three foot tall rod puppets um, on, on big sticks. And we were sort of dressed in black underneath them. And it was a piece by Debussy called Le Boite Juju, The Box of Toys. And this was done with a live orchestra conducted by Simon Rattle. Right, okay. The director of the, uh, the conductor of the Birmingham uh, Symphony Orchestra at the time. The CBSO, and then went on to be the uh, artistic director of the Berliner Phil. It's come back to London now. Uh, so this was a major, major thing. So yeah, I kind of hit the ground running with them, Excellent which was amazing. Stuff. That's brilliant. How, did, how old were you then, Simon? Oh, so I would have been, so I left school when I was 18. Uh, so yeah, 19. Yeah. When I did that. But it's in, you said about, you know, you can't get a GCSE in puppetry and you're right. But I remember I went to a very ordinary comprehensive school in Merseyside where I grew up. And um, there was a puppet festival happening in London in 1979, an international festival with puppeteers coming from literally all over the world. And they were the puppeteers who you know, had studied pictures of their puppets in books and heard people talk about seeing them. And, and I went to see my head teacher and said, look, this is happening and it's during term time and I would really love to go. And, you know, it was amazing because it was a pretty, it was a pretty rough, you know, all boys comprehensive school in Merseyside. And Mr. Elmer said, Simon, this is part of your education that we can't give you. You must go, you know, go and spend three days down there and just, you know, write us a report for the school magazine when you get back. Oh, brilliant. So they gave you their blessing. Absolutely. Yeah. I thought that was really far sighted of him. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. You know, not everybody would have done that. So uh, no. shout out to him. What was his name again? Mr. Elmer. Mr. Elmer, shout out to you, sir. Indeed. <laughs> Might be shouting out that way now, I think, but I'm not sure. It was a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, nonetheless, what a legend. What a legend. Yeah. Just patting you on the back and letting you do your thing. That's fantastic. And, you know, he was obviously, it speaks for itself. He was right to do so. Look at the legacy yes. there. That's amazing. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so, so you've worked on many big sets, just to name a few. Yeah. Uh, Spit an image. Yeah. Um, you've worked on Muppets Treasure Island. Muppets yeah. Christmas Carol also. Yeah. And one of my favourite movies as well growing up, Labyrinth. Ah, yes. Um, can we talk a little bit, bit about Labyrinth first of all? How did that come well, about? Well, that, that's also the right one to talk about first. because it's Excellent. The movie yeah, let, let's go in order if we can. You steer me in the right direction. <laughs> You'd think we'd scripted this, wouldn't you? Oh, well, um, you know. <laughs> I hope we you haven't, have. I assure you, we haven't. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was working for the theatre company in Birmingham. 
as I say. And then my time there was sort of drawing to a close. And a friend of mine had gone to work for on Labyrinth. And he phoned me up and said, they need for one big scene, people that can operate string puppets, like my trusty little wizard, you see. Excellent. He, he remembered that I did that. So they asked me to go down and audition. And, and I did, and I, I went, I got the job, which was very good. Um, I got, I managed to fit it in in a break between the last few weeks of um, the show I was doing in Birmingham. So I went from being in the Three Little Pigs, for which <laughs> I did eight performances a week and was paid £87.50, <laughs> onto, onto the to Shepparton Studio. No, Pi, uh, yeah, Shepparton, no, it wasn't. It was uh, L Street Studios. Right. L Street Studios um, uh, in Boreham Wood uh, and was on just under £900 a week. <laughs> as opposed to the 89 pound, 87 pound 50 I was used to um, and and spent two weeks on Labyrinth and it was for a big scene in the castle uh, when David Barry throws the baby in the air there's a song called Dance Magic Dance yeah I know us and, funny uh, enough I'm in an 80s dance. tribute band and we, we cover that song <laughs> you. it's a great yeah. song yeah yeah it fantastic song. and uh, on that there was a big set all raised off the ground and so underneath the set working hand puppets through the floor, you had about 40 to 50 hand puppeteers. There were then little people in costumes on ropes being pulled up. Um, there were live chickens and piglets running around. There were clockwork things. There yeah. was David Bowie. And then there was four or maybe five of us on gantries, 40 foot above the stage, working marionettes on these incredibly long strings. So what you had to do was actually work slightly ahead of the beat of the music because right. there was a, just a slight delay on the string. <laughs> and you, know, you, you looked at the puppeteers who were all out of time with the music, but their puppets were in time. With yeah, the music. yeah, that, that's what counts, right? <laughs> exactly, that's all that mattered. And uh, and that was just, I mean, I met some amazing people through that, including David Barry. Oh, you did? That was one of my questions, actually, yeah? Well, he was astonishing because he, when we took a break, um, you know, when they called the tea break for 15 minutes, he just joined in the queue for the tea trolley along with everybody else. That's incredible. No yeah. liberties. Normally they're, you know, they're out of the door, they've gone to their Winnebago, they've got somebody sponging them down and pouring them champagne or whatever. And, and I'm standing in the queue and just not really knowing very many people have sort of run out of chat, turned around and there's David Barry standing behind me who says, Hello, Dave. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, I won't say you're David Barry, are you? Because that would just yeah. be amazing. But that's all I could think, you know. Oh, you know, amazing. amazing. But it was funny with the very long strings. Uh, it was quite complicated to do. And Jim Henson, who created the Muppets, and of course voiced Kermit the Frog, and you know, the, the, the great man himself, uh, he was directing. And uh, uh, there was one point at which the camera moved around and the camera went a little bit further than it normally was, was supposed to. Okay. Around. And something on the side of the camera caught the string of my goblin puppet. Uh... And until eventually, this puppet sort of went straight into the <laughs> And so Jim and I met at that moment when he looked up and said, uh, I don't know who you are, but that's kind of a no-no. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim, my string got caught in. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And I'll be there. Um, so that was my introduction to life with the Muppets, really. Oh, but it fantastic. was an amazing film to be part of. And it actually didn't do that well when it first came out. Did and it I, not? I, no, and people didn't really know what to make of it. Uh, but subsequently, it's become a real cult classic. Oh, definitely. I was going to use the words cult classic, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I love it, you know, and generations below me now as well. I introduced those to it as well. It's just a timeless classic, I think it is. It's amazing. I, I was on it for just under two weeks. Yeah. And I was really there just for, for one scene. And I couldn't believe it when I got then invited to the crew screening. But then in the post arrived this big cardboard tube and when I unrolled it, there was the poster, the original movie poster, on which was written in big felt pen, Simon, thank you, Jim Henson. Oh, wow, that's incredible. I, I have to say, um, you know, I have that hanging in my kitchen here, and I still get people coming in, you know, boiler. somebody comes in to, you know, bleed the radiator or fix the boiler or something, and they do a double take. Yeah. Uh, well, I love that movie. And then they, they spot the... <laughs> the yeah. That Jim's written on it, and they say, Your name's Simon, isn't it? Is that you? And uh, it's quite then amazing. the penny drops, so to speak. Penny yeah, Absolutely. amazing, amazing. Yeah. So, so Labyrinth, lots of good memories working on Labyrinth then. And it was through working on Labyrinth that I met some of the guys that worked on Spitting Image. All right, okay, said, you come and work on Spitting Image. 
Um, and so I went and auditioned for Spitting Image. Um, and at that time, it was directed by John John Lloyd, who did not the Nine O'clock News and a whole host of iconic, uh, you know, British sitcoms and comedy programs. And we did an audition, and I think there were about fifteen or sixteen puppeteers. And John was great. He just had this huge um, box full of puppet characters, and they were all the sort of mostly the what we would call the generic characters. So mm. you know, he didn't produce the Queen and Princess Diana. It was just girl one, girl two, boy yeah. two press reporter pig, whatever it would be. And then he came to eyes the last one he, at the bottom. He said, oh, Simon, he said, you won't have a clue who this is supposed to be. This is the Archbishop of Canterbury. No way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't ordained at that time, but it was- I was gonna say, you come full circle. <laughs> uh, and it was just, and it was Robert Runcie who had a he had a slightly peculiar, rather rather camp and pinched voice, and so it was rather <laughs> nice. That we all had to improvise with the puppets, so I was immediately, you know, I knew what to do with it. Brilliant. So, so, uh, so were you doing voices yourself then as well? Not, uh, I did voices in the theatre. Yeah. But at that point, for television, all, nearly all the voices uh, were pre-recorded. Okay. The spitting image was slightly unusual. The Muppets always did live voices. Mm. Um, but for uh, Spitting Image, they tried with the very first series to find puppeteers who could do impressions and impressionists who could puppeteer. Mm. And as you can imagine, they're two very separate skills. Totally, yeah. Um, so, so they ended up, they moved quite quickly to a system where they pre-recorded all the voice tracks, a bit like a radio play. Yeah. So you get Steve Nallon as Margaret Thatcher and uh, Chris Barry, who was President Reagan at the time, and mm -hmm. John Sessions and John Thompson, all these amazing people, and Jan Ravens, get them around the microphone. They'd re pre record the sketches, and then we would mime to those sketches. Okay, right. So, so just get the time in right. and everything to go along with the voices, okay. et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Yeah. Brilliant. So, so memories of working on Spit and Image then, how was that for you, and how long did you spend on the show? Oh gosh! Um, well, Spitting Image ran for eighteen series, which is oh, was nice. it? Was it that long? The original yeah. series, yeah. Not eighteen years, but eighteen series. Right. I think it ran for. Um, and I was I joined on series two. I had a little break in the middle, and then I was on it to the end. I was, um, and uh, so I've just got notes saying my internet connection is unstable. Ah, that's cool. I, I could still hear you. You just uh, the visual paused for a moment. That's okay. all. Okay. Um, so I, I began life as Margaret Thatcher's right hand and ended up as the whole of Tony Blair. Fantastic. Which, which is an interesting kind of political trajectory. Because <laughs> yeah. Those puppets, well, they're the size of Nobby the Sheep, who you can see is, you know, yeah. is, is a big puppet. Is a big yeah, he's pretty much life size, isn't he? He is. And the, the spitting image puppets were all life size, wearing ordinary human clothes. And so you'd have one person, if Nobby was a spitting image puppet, mm. one person would have their right hand, if they're right handed in the mouth, okay. and their left hand in, in the sleeve and into the left hand of the puppet. And then a second puppeteer would work the right arm and a third puppeteer would work the eyes. And if it was Prince Charles, whose ears wiggled, <laughs> like, so large, you'd have a fourth puppeteer doing that. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So it was yeah. a real team effort, but you gradually worked your way up from doing eyes and hands onto whole characters. So I eventually became, um, as well as uh, uh, Tony Blair, oh, the Queen, Jeremy Paxman, Princess Diana, Barbara Cartland, Joanna, Joanna Lumley, including her legs, uh, with my own legs. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, you name it, a load of them. What, you controlled Joanna Lumley's legs using your own legs, yeah? <laughs> no, we actually, so let me just show you a little a bit of secret here, which I shouldn't really show you. So oh, go on. Nobby, Nobby stops at the groin. Ah, right, okay. Because when you you know when you see him like that, you just imagine there's yeah you do your your mind takes over doesn't it goes in the blanks. So the the spitting image puppets only exist down to the waist. Okay. So if you wanted to do a shot uh, a long shot, you could do it with them sat in a chair where you put the puppet in front of the puppeteer, and the the waist of the puppet basically butts into the groin of the puppeteer, okay. and then you use your own legs. Right. So I had I had a load of you mentioned transitioning earlier. I had a load of shoes bought for me from a transsexual shop <laughs> in in uh, Houston. And what, I what size my, fit you? <laughs> nine. <laughs> so I had my Joanna Lumley stilettos. I had my Queen's brogues. I had my Norma Major court shoes. Um, and very funnily, one time uh, <laughs> I was actually doing some voiceovers for a children's series called Potamus Park, and I had to go and dub some of the episodes we'd recorded. And as I was waiting for the doorbell to go, uh, for the doorbell to be answered, 
I could hear some footsteps coming up behind the stairs behind me, and I turned around, and there was Joanna Lumley. Oh wow, incredible! And, uh, and we spoke briefly, and she was utterly delightful, as you would hope. And I couldn't help but look at her legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a terrible disservice I'd done. That <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's what spit and image was all about, wasn't it? It was it was taking things and just you know molding them to the extreme, just turning the volume up on things. So yeah, that's that's a good thing. I'm sure it worked well. And, and and people, you know, they, they were actually upset if they weren't on it. Yeah. They didn't always like what we did with them, um, but they, yeah, they, they wanted to be on. That was, <laughs> and most, most people, I think, in, you know, in the 80s and, uh, and 90s, yeah, 80s, 90s, you know, we knew the politicians because we recognised them from their puppets on Spitting Image. Mm. It, wasn't, it wasn't the other way around. Uh, and, yeah, they, they regarded it as a badge of honour to be turned into a Spitting <laughs> Image puppet. Fantastic. I dare say it was brilliant. Amazing. Great show. Great memories. I, the... I think it used to come on on a Sunday evening, didn't it, back in the day? I'd be up late watching That's it right. about 10 o'clock, I think I want to say. 10 o'clock. Red yeah. eye in the, on the school course... register the next morning. Great stuff. <laughs> and because one of the things about the time that we did it, uh, it went out as exactly as you say at 10 o'clock on ITV. And it only went out once. You know, there was no ITV2. People didn't have video recorders in those days. Yeah. So it was a real event. You know, it was you you watch it or you miss it. Mm. And so, you know, the, during the week, you know, everybody at work on Mondays was saying, you know, did you see Spitting Image last night? And if ever I got a taxi anywhere and mentioned that I worked on Spitting Image, if I was being taken to, a, again, in rehearsal or something, and I'd say, what, you know, what are you going to do? Oh, every cab driver would tell you about their favourite sketch on Spitting Image. <laughs> you remember the one that this happened, and then the one, and how did they do that? And it was it was amazing to be part of something that everybody knew. You know, you just said, oh, I, I work on, on Spitting Image. Yeah, it was and a big deal. Everybody was fascinated. Absolutely. Was oh, it was a huge show back in the day, you know. Yeah. But what, what do you think of the, the new version of Spitting Image? Uh, have you any opinions on that? Have you seen it at all, or...? <laughs> I, I, I don't have the platform to see the whole thing, but I've seen some clips. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, inevitably, people have said for years, you know, spitting image should come back. Mm. Um, I think there's a question about how you kind of make a caricature of something that's already become a bit of a joke of itself. You know, yeah. how do you caricature Donald Trump? Uh. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard, actually, and, and our own prime minister. I mean, it's difficult <laughs> stuff. But I think, you know, I think it works. I think it's good for me. Some One of the things that I liked about the original spitting image was that the sketches were usually very short. Yeah. And just very punchy. And it was just gag, gag, gag. You know, and you kept That's right. It was on. just from one to the next then. Yeah. yeah. And I, for me, some of the sketches on the new version just were too long. It's like. Right. OK. Yeah. I, I feel like yourself, I, I've not seen it myself. I've seen some clips and everything. And I'm I'm unsure. You know, I'm just like, right. It wasn't broke. Don't try to fix it now, sort of thing. You know, that's just my opinion on it. You know, yeah, it's, I think it's very hard to bring back something that people, many people, have very clear memories of. Yeah, but I also recognise there's a whole new generation who I say, you know, I worked on Spitting Image. Yeah, uh, or up until a year ago, I'd say that, and they'd say, and that, what is that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Now they've had an introduction to what it is, what it's all about. I suppose exactly. so this they'll is, have more this of an is... idea. This is new spitting image for a new generation, and it's keeping some of my old mates in work. So I'm all in favour of it. Yeah, that's what it's all about, after yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent yeah. stuff. So can we talk a little bit about the Muppets? How did you get involved with that? And um, which was it first? Was it Treasure Island first that you were involved in? Uh, no, it would have been Christmas Carol. Right, um, OK. Which, again, and I can't remember what I was working on at the time. Might have been something with him. Mm. Um, and I, I, I wasn't available very much. So I just went in and did a few odd days. And actually, somebody asked me just the other day what I did on Christmas Carol. And there's a scene in Mr. Uh, Fozziewig's house, played, of course, by Fozzie Bear. Yeah. Um, and there's a big a banquet going on. And the Swedish chef is singing Deck the Halls with Bows of Holly. And as he lifts up the, the silver domes on, on, on a plate, on a big table of uh, food, there are bunches of grapes that sing la 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 and I was one of those singing bunches. Right, of okay, excellent stuff. Uh, and then various characters in the background. Yeah. So the way, that, the way the Muppet movies work is that all the characters, the main characters like Gonzo and Miss Piggy and so on, they're all you know, permanently performed by American puppeteers who do the voices and perform the puppets. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, so really the Brits are brought in to do the extra hands and all the background characters. Right. 
I get you. And uh, so, yeah, you're, you're generally you know, in the background or sometimes on what they call second unit. So, for example, they might have, uh, you know, that have, I forget who was doing Fozzie Bear, uh, uh, yeah, Fozzie Bear at that time. Um, but, you know, you'd have, yeah, who was it? Because originally that was, um, that was Frank Oz, Frank Oz, uh, who also did Miss Piggy. But I'd, I can't remember if he, if he was there. But so Frank would have done Fozzie Bear in the wide shot. And then if they wanted to pick up a close up shot of Fozzie Bear's hands doing something or Fozzie Bear from behind, they'd have got <laughs> one of the Brits in to, to do that. Right. So to Frank, muck in, yeah, look. To muck in and, yeah, <laughs> do, be, be their doubles. And it was quite funny because on, on Treasure Island, I did a lot of uh, rehearsing for Gonzo, uh, Gonzo scenes for Dave Goltz. And uh, you know, we had to wear white gloves so we didn't make their puppets sweaty. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it, you'd rehearse the scene through sometimes. And then when they were ready to do a take, you'd, you'd hand these precious babies over <laughs> to the proper puppeteers and the British puppeteers would retreat into the shadows. You know, we knew our places. Yeah, amazing. But, uh, it's still amazing to be to be part of that. And it's a huge that. deal, a massive deal. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's Christmas Carol in particular. You know, every year, you, you know, the, the kids are, are all over it. You know, it's like, oh, it's Christmas Carol time. You know, then the Christmas is on its way. Christmas is Absolutely. arriving when yeah. Muppets Christmas Carol does the rounds, you know. So, yeah, I think it's, it's been something like the top five Christmas movies of all time. It's got to um, be. It is, it is a fantastic film. Mm. You know, in terms of the characters, the writing, not just as Charles Dickens, but, you know, and then the way it looks, you, know, you get this whole completely believable world. And that was one of the great things about going on to Labyrinth and, um, and, and, and then uh, Christmas Carol and Treasure Island as well. But you just, you just feel like you're in those places. Mm. And the detail. And they're slightly scaled down, so you feel like you don't quite fit, quite literally. <laughs> but it's, it's extraordinary, the talent that goes into those movies is quite phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. I can only begin to imagine from uh, looking at it from, from your view, rather than yeah. the, what we are seeing on the screen must be yeah. totally different, you know, and it's, it's unimaginable to me. You know? yes. And even when you're there on the set, your mind very quickly blocks out all the bits you shouldn't, that the viewer won't see, because you just get so engaged in, in the bit that we are supposed yeah. to see. that's super there. cool. Yeah. That's amazing, brilliant, yeah. fantastic. Right. Um, so we'll talk a bit about this guy there now then, Nobby. Yeah. Um, his first introduction, or my first introduction to Nobby, was on Ghost Train. Uh, yeah. Was that where he made his television debut? Indeed. Uh, yes, Nobby was. Uh, yes, he was. <laughs> I've just clocked something out of the corner of my eye, which I'll get down to. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, yeah, so and Nobby made his debut on Ghost Train, and that was my first foray into doing live television. Right. And so I, you were also the voice of Nobby as well, then? Yeah, is that yeah, right? And that, that was the first time I'd also done a voice. For a puppet on television. Okay, how, how how was that for you? Well, it was terrifying. It really <laughs> was terrifying because there was just so much to think about, and and what people don't don't understand is if you're a presenter and you're interviewing, I don't know, Kylie Minogue, for example, yeah. who he interviewed several times. Yeah, that's right. You know, you as a person sit down opposite Kylie Minogue and you talk and you pick up her latest album, or, you know, CD or whatever, and you, you, know, you look at the cover and you look at the songs on the back. Well, I'm underneath the table. I've got my head up as Jackson. I can't see it. <laughs> Quite there. literally. Quite literally. And uh, I was also, in fact, outside the ghost train, which was a travelling truck yeah. in a howling gale, with my chest up through a hole in the floor, with him above my head. I'm watching a little black and white screen which is showing the camera shot. So I can see where Kylie Minogue is in relation to him. Because obviously he can't see. Yeah. And I'm also having to listen to her voice come via the gallery and through an earpiece. And, you know, unless if the camera was close on the puppet, I can't see what's around me. So I would go to pick up something to show her. Look at this letter, Kylie, that somebody sent in. I'd go to reach for it. The cameraman would cut to her. And I'm thinking, well, where's the letter gone? Oh, I can't no. See it it's in the shot. So there was a lot of sort of technical stuff to think through. And it was going out live with an absolutely minimal rehearsal. Mm, don't and feel so the pressure. <laughs> ah, the pressure, it was immense. And I will be honest, uh, there were times when I woke up on a Saturday morning and prayed that some local vandals had burnt the wretched ghost train oh, down. Oh, no. And I didn't have to do it. Because <laughs> it was just, the pressure felt so great. Yeah. But it, it was fantastic. And um, uh, Nobby the Sheep, sorry, I'll keep talking. Nobby the Sheep did also take me to Australia. So I should have got some props ready. Oh, so, that's cool. No worries, that. There's, there's Nobby and I. 
I think that's about 1990, maybe. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we're at the Sydney Zoo, and actually, Kylie Minogue took us around the zoo, and uh, and I also spoke to interview Danny in the most Danny Minogue in a fantastic apartment overlooking the uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Oh wow! Subsequently, whenever I saw Danny on and later times, she said, "I never appreciated that view until I saw your reaction to it." Yeah. Because um, she said, "I just grew up with it," and she said, "We were we were in this stunning hotel." Uh, overlooking this with this just spectacular view and yeah she made us we made her re reappreciate her own city fantastic um, i suppose when you see it every day and you grow up with it you often take it for granted they say with me in the welsh valleys you know we got a brecon beacons on our doorstep and everything yeah, yeah. uh people from outside of these valleys they come along they're like wow you know and you're like yeah actually you know yeah you're right they, they do like you say they make you appreciate what you got and uh yeah, yeah. sydney harbour though Phenomenal. Oh, fantastic. And we also interviewed Jason Donovan there, who I'd interviewed a couple of times before. I remember him being on there, yeah. He was just wonderful. And I, I saw him not one-to-one, -one, but I saw him on Friday night because he was at, he's at the London Palladium at the moment in Joseph and the That's Magic. That's right, yeah. He's he's a, yeah, I and did try to get him on, see, and, uh, and they said, um, oh, he's far too busy with Joseph at the moment. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, Nobby covered the opening night of Joseph at the Palladium, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which was quite amazing. So yeah, Nobby, he was he was good. He was the first. He wasn't the first puppet on live Saturday morning kids TV program, but he was the first puppet that actually acted like a presenter. So yeah. Ghost Train, and then subsequently, so Ghost Train ran for three years, and then for another three years, I did a show called Gimme Five. I remember Gimme Five as well. Yeah, Jenny Powell, and uh, in that one particularly. Nobby it was just one of the presenters. Mm. Uh, it actually was very funny. I was invited with the Ghost Train crew to Jason Donovan's 21st birthday party. He just hasn't brought the sheep. Oh, he lost me. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I've, I've still got you. I managed, managed to pick up. It was a bit breaky, it was, that's all. But uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you can go again there, if that's okay. Sure. Absolutely. So I was invited to Jason Donovan's 21st birthday party with... Not, well, not with as Nobby the Sheep, but not with Nobby the Sheep. Yeah. And all the presenters went along in a limousine. And as we all piled out, the paparazzi descended and uh, wanted to get photographs. And they asked me to move out of the way because obviously <laughs> they were used to see me on television. And the presenters were really sweet. And they would say, no, he's the most popular one on the show. And they're like, yeah, whatever. They moved me out of the way. <laughs> so, yeah, if so only they knew, right? If only they knew. Said, Everybody knew Nobby the Sheep, but nobody had a clue who I was. So. Uh, that, that, that's, that, you know, take what you will of that. Take the rough with the smooth there, isn't it? You absolutely. Know? Absolutely. There is a lovely picture I just want to show you. Uh, just, let me just get this down. Yeah, let's have a look. That's great. This, this, will, this will show you how young I was when I started being Nobby oh, the wow. Sheep. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Funnily <laughs> enough. Yeah, that's our thumbnail, funnily enough. I will show really? it back to you. I will show it back to you right about now, if I can. Hold on one second. If we just look here and just do this. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, I have been uh, having a look and trying to dig out some oldies to, to get yeah. the thumbnail. So, uh, yeah, that's the one. What a coincidence, right? There you go. <laughs> That's the original photo. Brilliant. That's fantastic. I was going to ask as well, obviously, with Nobby being the presenter and everything then for the show, all right, that's obviously a different concept for guests to, to adopt. Um, yeah. Were they all pretty much susceptible to it or were, were some of them, I don't know, a bit standoffish in what they were doing? Because yeah. I'd imagine their publicists and their agents were putting them forward for the shows, etc. How did people, different people react most, or respond? Most people uh, were, were fine. A, a few were really not. Right, um, okay. And, and it was interesting. There were times when a band would come on and they'd refuse to talk to, to Nobby the Sheep. And then later in the programme, they, you know, they'd, see, they'd see other guests interacting with the sheep. And then they'd say, oh, actually, no, it's fine. We will do it. By which point our producers would say, well, sorry, it's too late now. We've, yeah. you know, we've restructured. Your interview is going to be done with whoever. And, you know, you can't. And they'd be get, get quite miffed about it. <laughs> uh, well, it um, serves their right. Only one or two, but... <laughs> Exactly. Only one or two felt that this was demeaning. There was a band called Big Country, and um, 
uh, on in New Musical Express, the lead singer of Big Country was quoted as you know talking about his career and said, "What the most humiliating thing is that my kids are more Im Im impressed with me talking to effing knob end the sheep <laughs> than <laughs> than every anything else I've ever done." <laughs> Uh, which I thought was very funny. That's incredible. Yeah, but most <laughs> when they when they realised that actually Nobby's uh, role wasn't to kind of make fun of them, mm. he wasn't playful with them, but he'd never try and undermine them. And I think television has changed a lot since he and I were, were doing the Saturday morning stuff, and um, people are much more um, risque in a way now. And it was a bit more formal back in in those days. Mm. And Nobby could be flirty with the girls in a way that no human presenter could be. Or and get really, away with. <laughs> and get away with it. And, and be equally chummy with the lads in a way that would just look like a bit, oh, it's a bit cringeworthy. A bit awkward, like that. Yeah. But because he was a sheep, you know, he could just get away with murder in any way. <laughs> uh, and there was a song, the, Sonia, the little scouse singer of one of the big stuff, Cake and Waterman artists. And she came on our show several times and loved to singing to Nobby. And there was one song, I can't remember what it was now. And she took his hand and she was leaning her head and he was snuggling in and she kissed him and they were cheek to cheek. Magical. Just, it was fantastic. And I could hear the, the director and everybody in the gallery just squealing with delight. <laughs> Even if she couldn't have done that. No, no. Be alongside the, human presenter. Yeah, there'd be oh, letters and all sorts, wouldn't there, you know? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, he... he Doing it as a puppet character did mean it gave you a different kind of relationship with the guests. Definitely, the and it allowed you to do a little bit extra then, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Brilliant. So It made all the pain worthwhile. Ah, absolutely. So he looks, obviously, we've talked about the size of him and everything. He looks a big lad. Yeah. What, what is he made of, and what would he weigh? Uh, is it, are they heavy, or...? I mean, some of the puppets are quite heavy. Some of the spitting image puppets were very heavy. They were, uh, yeah. And the, and the weight really depended on the amount of mechanisms. Okay. Inside. So he is, uh, it's a foam latex skin over a fiberglass skull. And then the body is a, is a mixture of composite of, of foam. And uh, um, actually there's a wooden structure in him to keep the shape. Right. And it's more, more cumbersome than heavy. Yeah. You pick Nobby the sheep up and you think, oh, he's not heavy at all. But when he's up there, and it, it gets very heavy. Mm. Uh, most puppeteers are slightly, you know, uh, walk with a slight hunchback because they've been yeah, a bit lopsided, like <laughs> all a bit lopsided. Um, and we spend a lot of time sort of lying on the floor or squashed into corners and things. Yeah, crammed um, into little spaces. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but the, the weight, particularly on the spitting image puppets, goes just kind of on the top of your hands. So if you imagine that's the jaw. Mm. And so you've got this unnatural amount of weight just just pushing down there where you've not got a lot to sort of support it. So it's it's surprisingly, you know, intense and, and challenging work. And certainly on Spitting Image, we it was one, Louise Gold was the only female puppeteer that we regularly had. Um, she was quite tall and quite, quite strong. But generally, it was they were all male puppeteers just to handle the, the physicality. Yeah. Of it. In those days, I think that has changed a bit now. But back, back, back in my day, um, yeah, it was all because the puppets were ridiculously heavy at times. Yeah, felt like you'd had a workout. Exactly. The, uh, the clothing was all, you know, human clothes. So, so if you had a puppet that was wearing, you know, for example, if you're in the House of Commons and you've got the Speaker of the House, you know, with, with a suit on and a waistcoat and a shirt and tie, and then they put a robe, you know, cloak over him as well. Yeah. Oh, it's ways up, you know, yeah, that, that just adds to it. Yeah, yeah, each layer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, fantastic. So Nobby joined you obviously on Ghost Train. He was with you on Gimme Five as well. Was was that correct? correct. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then from there, you also took him. We talked about it a little earlier on onto the weakest link. Um, <laughs> how was that? How was <laughs> Anne? Uh, <laughs> so did she treat him well or not? <laughs> well, I. I and laugh, which was a bit of an achievement. And you I made Anne laugh. I know. That's why it is. <laughs> I'm sure she's forgotten it now. But uh, <laughs> she, uh, I'd never seen the show. Well, I'd seen it, but I'd never watched it. Yeah. Worked, to be honest. But there you go. And it was an all puppet version. So all of the contestants were puppet characters. So there was Sooty and Sweet. There was Roland Rat. There was Zippy and George from Rainbow. There was. 
Capricorns from another ITV Saturday morning show, BBC Saturday morning show. There was Otis the Aardvark, if I mentioned him, Roland Rat. Oh, they were, they were all. They yeah. were all. There. And um, uh, in the end, I, I got down to the last three before I got knocked out, which I was really, really pleased about. But I made refer- two things I did that made Anne laugh, actually. One was that just as a throwaway when she was very mean to him. Yeah. And he cringed under his desk and he said, Robinson, oh, wrong Anne. And, uh, and she, she did laugh at that, actually. Her <laughs> face did crack. And then the second thing was that I, I was able, he was able to say that he knew somebody who'd worked on Spitting Image. Uh-huh, and right. Anne, Robinson, Anne Robinson had written in to complain that the voice wasn't right. Ah, oh, right, okay. And she laughed and she looked at the audience and she said, I did actually. Ah. <laughs> That's a slight break in character there then. Exactly. So I got a little, a little chink of, of the A little around. crack. Exactly. <laughs> Good work, Simon. Good work. Brilliant stuff. Um, so, yeah, you've had a mag- magnificent career, a magnificent, colourful career in puppeteering then. So looking back at everything you've done, uh, all the puppets you've had your hand on, had your hand in, um, what was the, what were some of the best memories for you? Would you say? Oh gosh, that's that's a question to to spring on me. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the impact of walking on the labyrinth set really can't be repeated. Yeah. Um, the fun that we've had behind the scenes. So I worked on the movie Lost in Space with um, uh, Heather Graham and William Hurt and Matt LeBlanc and. Oh, whoever else was on that movie. And uh, just the fun, the interaction with some of those guys, particularly Matt behind the scenes. was. I just could fun. imagine. Um, he would come and, come and flop in our dressing room. And he said, uh, I'm down the corridor with William Hurt. It's like a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we were sort of 10 pin bowling in the corridors and things in between shots. Um, I worked on a movie in the Dolomites uh, with all about grizzly bears. Mm. And we'd be up at three in the morning to drag this million pound animatronic up a mountainside to catch the sunset. And all oh, just like, what the heck are we doing? Uh, um, <laughs> see, so, these, these are all the bits that we don't see on our screen, you know? Indeed. But actually the thing that I love, oh, I've got another guy here you may recognise. Um, the thing that I love, you know, I, I've, I've never been one for complicated puppets. Um, and my dear friend John Henderson, who's the most fantastic uh, director, uh, called me very sweetly the master of the little puppet. And I mm-hmm. think it's probably run quite little. So a small puppet like Crazy Keith. Oh, <laughs> wicked! <laughs> um, so Nev and Crazy Keith were on Bear Behaving Badly together with Bella Emberg yeah. and Bonnie Harwood and a great cast of their characters. And, and I just love that thing of, you know, having something as simple as, as he is on your hand that people believe in, you know, That's it. and they you know, just, yeah, because I'm real, mate. I am. <laughs> I'm not a puppet. He's the puppet. Thanks, Nev. Uh, <laughs> I don't know which one you are. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, just so many great memories and it's been a real privilege to do over the years, you know, just to do something that brings such delight to people. One of the things very briefly was where Nobby was at his sort of peak. Um, the amount of fan mail he got was quite extraordinary. But amongst the fan mail and sometimes envelopes of grass, and I do mean grass, not mm. grass, uh, that people would send him, um, were letters from children about all sorts of things. And, and, you know, I remember one letter from a little boy who's been bullied at school. And he, he said, you're the, one, you're the one person, Nobby, who keeps me going. Oh, I love him. You at the weekend. And he'd only see him on television. Yeah. You know, that, that gets me through all the horrible times at school. And, and I was very careful in every time I got a letter or a card with an address on, I always responded, always yeah. wrote uh, to those children. Because that relationship, you just, you just never knew the impact of what you were doing would, would have on, on, a, on a child at home. Mm. And that's such an important thing to, for anybody working in the media and on television to remember. We don't, you know, you put your show out, you have no idea what effect it's going to have on people, what it's going to mean to people. And we really shouldn't underestimate that privileged position and, and the, the potential we have just to do good through it all and just to make people's difficult lives sometimes just that little bit better. That's it. And it's only a small thing as well, isn't it? Just to it reply, hey, yeah. thank you for your letter. Great stuff. Exactly. Stay cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ah, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, b- before I wrap up with you, Simon, I'll, I'll leave yeah. you get on with your day. Is there anything else you want to plug? Any shout outs, any acknowledgements or anything? 
Oh, gosh, no. I, I mean, I'd just like to pay tribute to all the, you know, the wonderful puppeteers who've inspired me down the years, um, particularly when I was a teenager. Many of those, not all, but many of those have now, you know, departed this life. Um, but and, and my grandparents, you know, who who bought me Sooty and Sweep, not knowing what impact that would have. So yeah, I would just what they created. Well, be careful what you buy for your grandparents, because look where it might end up. <laughs> you never know what it's going to lead on to. Uh, and on a day when Tom Daly has just got gold with Matty <laughs> Lee in the Olympics, you know, big shout out to him and the encouragement again from his dad that kept him going. So, you know, people with kids nurture their talent, whatever it is, whether it's puppets, diving, cookery, even if they think they have no talent, just nurture them. Fantastic advice. Well, Simon, it's been a genuine pleasure talking to you. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to speak to me. Um, I wish you all the best for the future. Uh, hopefully I'll bump into you again down the line sometime. You have a great day. So. It's been a joy. Thanks, Carl. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Simon Buckley, everybody. Woohoo!